Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. A couple of people are still popping in, so I'm just admitting people as they come, but we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Olivia Wolf. I'm stepping in for Clarice Wheeler, and I'll be hosting tonight. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Northern Nevada Programs Coordinator at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. And I'm excited to see a couple people on here that I've met on some of our volunteer trips before. Uh, before we get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that here in Reno, in Northern Nevada, we are on the unceded ancestral lands of the Washoe and Northern Paiute or Numu people. Where our speaker David resides is the unceded ancestral lands of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla tribes. What is now Nevada is home to 27 federally recognized and countless more non-federally recognized tribes of indigenous people. These people are the original stewards of the land and continue to care for our precious natural resources to this day. I would like to invite you to take a moment to consider the legacies of colonization and how they have brought you here today. So for those of you that might be new to our speaker series, Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a statewide nonprofit focused on protecting wild places. Wilderness areas are natural landscapes that are largely unaffected by people. We protect these lands in a few main ways. We advocate by speaking up for these lands to help get them permanently protected and manage to maintain their wildness. We educate by sharing the values and vision of wilderness at community events, presentations like this one, and finding the common ground to protect our wildland heritage. And we steward. Because these lands cannot protect themselves, we work with volunteers on the ground to help monitor, restore, and improve access to these special places. We hold this Wild Speaker series the first Thursday of every month by hosting an environmental expert for people who are interested in learning more about the outdoors and ways to get involved with conservation efforts. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker. David Lucas, who was also our speaker last month, is a speaker, writer, and naturalist who has led thousands of walks, talks, classes, workshops, and tours, including more than 10 years working as a prolific hiking guide and educator in Yosemite National Park. This is, a, this is part two of our four-part bird series, so he'll be joining us for the next two month, months as well, talking all about bird biology and birding in the Great Basin. Next month is all about bird color, and I'm gonna go ahead and pop next month's RSVP link in the chat, so you're welcome to sign up anytime tonight if you'd like. Hmm. Some, house some housekeeping notes before we jump in. Please keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking. And if we begin to have any bandwidth issues, I will turn off everyone's camera so our speaker can come through clearly. Please drop your questions in the chat throughout the presentation and we will get to them once the presentation is finished. <clears throat> We'd love to hear what stands out to you too, even if you don't have any questions. So with that, David, I will pass it off to you. All right. Thank you so much, Olivia. Appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? All right. Good. Thank you so much. Um, it's so good to see everyone. I hope some people are back again from last um, month's talk that we gave. And it's a thrill to be doing this series here because then we can interconnect some of these subjects and just keep learning together. Tonight's talk is a really interesting one. It's called bird songs, but really it's about bird vocalizations um, and kind of getting you ready for the beginning of spring when birds will show up and start singing. Um, but birds are already vocalizing. So the kinds of stuff we're going to learn tonight will be applicable at any time of year. And a couple of uh, housekeeping things about this is this is a presentation that has sound files. Um, so it adds another level of technical complexity. Hopefully all the files work, we can hear everything. But I also want to just advise you to play with the volume at your end. Some bird songs are quieter, some are pretty loud. So you might need to adjust as we go at your end. Um, and so let's see, I have to do some setting up here. Okay. I think you can see that, but we need to, Olivia and I had to go through this beforehand, trying to get it to show up. So there we go. It doesn't put my picture on there and I can't see myself, <laughs> which makes it really hard. Okay. Uh, so just by way of introduction, uh, thank you for that, Olivia, too. Um, I spent my life working as a freelance naturalist, writing books, 
leading classes. Um, I did a book on Birds of the Great Basin, which is long out of print. So good luck if you find one of those. My current venture is um, giving these talks and also a newsletter that I'm doing every week. Um, so I put a little, let's see, can you see my cursor on here at all? I hope you can see my cursor here. I think you can. Um, yeah, we can see it. You're good. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I put a QR code on here. If you're not familiar with these, you can just take a picture of it with your phone and it'll put you right to my website and you can follow my newsletter from there if you're interested. Uh, no obligation. But tonight we're going to talk about understanding bird songs. And this is such a really interesting subject. And um, we all love hearing birds sing. Uh, we're humans have been fascinated with bird songs. But at the same time, birds are hard for us to listen to because we are visual creatures and we don't really have the vocabulary. A lot of us don't have the training for our ears to know how to interpret sound. And so with that in mind, how do we begin to understand the world of bird vocalizations? And uh, the point of my talk is to help unlock some of that for you so that even if you're not an expert listener, you know about music, you can still begin to appreciate some of the the some of the world of bird vocalizations. And just to start off, I think it's really interesting that the human study of bird song seems to extend back to the Paleolithic because it's telling that the oldest known musical instrument is a 44,000 year old flute made out of bird bone, which shows that already 44,000 years ago, before there was even language, people were starting to connect music and birds and the beginning of human culture and human arts. And I think that is just so interesting. Uh, I really love this quote from the first century BC. That's a long time ago. And already you can see in this quote that people are already connecting bird song with human culture and human arts. Thus birds instructed man and taught him songs before his art began. Already that awareness of the connection between humans and art and how we're imitating birds. Countless poets and philosophers, musicians and artists have grappled with bird songs. There's um, classical music symphonies based on bird songs. Uh, uh, philosophers, Aristotle grappling with bird songs. The philosopher Immanuel Kant, as some of you might know, made a really interesting point in his book called The Critique of Judgment. And he, he poses this question, why is it that we can listen to a bird in our backyard sing a simple melody for hours, just a couple of notes over and over again, and it just lifts our heart and totally enchants us. But if someone was in your backyard playing a flute over and over again with the same three notes, you'd go out and strangle them. Good question. So Kant kind of proposes the idea that there's something about birdsong that's sublime, that goes beyond their arts, that's raw and 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 irregular, and it takes us to another level. And I think that's a really good point to keep in mind. Um, and countless poets have worked to tirelessly capture the cadence and the music of bird songs and their poetry to let their poems try to mimic the beauty of bird songs. And some even try to literally mirror bird songs and the sounds of their words. The poet Walt Whitman talked to the naturalist uh, John Burroughs. Some of you might know John Burroughs. And John Burroughs told Walt Whitman, Whitman let the mockingbird be your muse. And if you read Whitman's poetry, you can see that in his poetry. So for example, if you know Northern Mockingbirds and their songs, I love this stanza right here. Soothe, 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 but my love soothes not me, not me. Perfect mockingbird cadence, just stands after stanza. And then while writers and poets are trying to mimic bird songs in their um, uh, words, musicians are trying to do it in their music. And like I mentioned, there's musical scores based on bird songs by like Beethoven, Vivaldi, for example. And you can understand this because before the advent of modern recording equipment, this was the only way to begin to capture the nuances of bird songs and try to share it with someone else was to put it in music. And in 1921, this fellow uh, Matthews, Schuler Matthews, wrote a book trying to put all of the bird songs of North America into musical notation. And again, before there was modern recording equipment, it makes sense that this would be the way you would share the differences of bird songs. 
So I'm going to play a fragment of this piano score imitating the wood thrush song. And this will be our first sound clip. So it gives us a chance to see if this works and to play with the volume. But I'll play some piano score. Did that work for everyone? I hope you can hear that. Yeah, um, that was good. OK, thank you. Um, so then I'm going to play a fragment of the actual bird song. And you begin to see how this falls apart. So I'm going to play. This is a this is the trickiest clip that in my whole program, I think. Let's see if it works. So that was a wood thrush song. It was this phrase right here. And this is the musical notation. So you can see how it sort of falls apart, but I really admire the effort to try to imitate bird songs with music. But all of this changed in World War II with the advent of a machine called a sonograph. And so for the first time, it gave us a visual representation of bird song as it occurs, a really incredible tool because we are visual creatures. So to see the shape of sound as it is made begins to unlock the magic of bird vocalizations for us and allowed scientists to start doing so much work understanding what's happening. There's two components to a sonograph. The first one is the oscillogram, which is just loudness. And we won't talk about this one. This is not so interesting to us because all it does is says, like, here's the bird song and time right here. It starts off quiet. It rises gradually to a peak, drops off, to silence, silent, rises quickly to a peak, goes across, comes down again. Not a lot of information there. But the other component is the sonogram. Now, this is what's really cool because this gives us the picture of the sound in terms of frequency and gives us a visual picture. So this is time going across here. So half a second right here, one second right here, second and a half here. This is the song over time. And then the vertical axis is the frequency in cycles per second. So the two right here is 2,000 cycles per second, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. So if you look at this one, this bird song is about 5,000 cycles for about three quarters of a second. There's a pause, drops down a little bit for another half a second, and then drops down to 3,000 cycles and then goes on. That is a lot more information. But this concept of cycles per second is a little hard to imagine. So let's go through this example here. So what's happening is sound is being produced. And in this case, we're hitting a drumstick on a drum. We hear it as a single sound. But what's happening is the drumstick is hitting the membrane. The membrane is going down. And as it goes down, it creates a vacuum of air molecules here. Then it bounces up. And it pushes air molecules together and creates a condensed band of air molecules. Then the membrane bounces down, creates another vacuum, then bounces up again. So each one of these cycles, plus and minus, like this, is one cycle. We're hearing thousands of these pulses per second reaching our ear as a single sound. So this is, this is what the graphs are showing us thousands of cycles per second arriving at our ear as a sound. If you make the membrane smaller or tighter, it's going to vibrate up and down faster. It's going to be more cycles per second. It's going to be a higher sound, a higher pitch, right? If the membrane is bigger or looser, it's going to vibrate up and down more slowly and be fewer cycles per second. It's going to be a lower sound. In this presentation, I'm going to be using these sonograms produced by uh, a free software that you can download yourself. It's from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. It's called Raven Light, R A V E N L I T E. And you can download this yourself. What we will be seeing through this presentation are images like this. Again, this is time going across the bottom axis, and then the number of frequency uh, in cycles per second going up on the up axis. And when you play it, there's a green bar that goes across. And as it hits each part of this picture, it plays that sound underneath the green bar and plays that shape. And you can see it and hear it at the same time, which is so cool. So this is what it's going to be like. 
During the presentation, I'm not going to show these active graphs. So I want to just give you one quick example of what it looks like when it's active. Okay. See the green bar going across? Oops. And then what I like to do is, uh, so that was at full speed. What I like to do is I like to play with it and play it at half speed. Oops. Um, okay, that's full speed. And you can play with all these parameters. Look at all these little controls at the top. You can do so much with this software. It's incredible. So here is half speed. Listen to this. This is where it gets interesting. I mean, all of a sudden, the world of bird song starts opening up. You can hear the nuances of what's going on. And then when you hear it in real life, you begin to hear those elements and those nuances because you've seen this picture and you've played with it like this. Incredible tool. So this is what's going to be in our presentation. I just want to capture the energy of it, that there's a bar that goes across and then it hits part. As it hits each part of the sound, it plays that part of the picture. So we make our sounds. In our uh, Adam's apple down here, this is our voice box right here in our throat. But in birds, they make their vocalizations in an area called the syrinx, which is in the center of the chest. And in some birds, they actually take the syrinx and wrap it around a hollow bone, the breastbone, to make really deep resonant sounds. Like imagine a sandhill crane going overhead, the deep, amazing resonant sound, because they have a resonant breastbone that's taking what the syrinx is doing and adding another element to it. The sound that's made in the syrinx is modified as it goes up the throat. It's modified inside the mouth and it's modified by the beak as it comes out. So the sound that comes out into the world is gonna be different than the sound that is first generated in the syrinx that's modified through its whole journey. And the location of the syrinx in a bird is deep down inside of the body cavity. When you do a bird dissection, you have to pull apart lots of tissues to get down to it. And it's very distinctive. It's where the trachea, the windpipe, comes down from the mouth to the lungs and it divides right here. And one bronchi goes to each lung. And this junction right here is the syrinx. So if we look at it in isolation, it's very distinctive. It's got these cartilage rings going around it that give it strength and structure. You know, a bird is moving constantly. It's flipping around, it's fighting in the wind. It's doing all kinds of things. And it needs to keep that structure intact for it can vocalize no matter what it's doing. And so these cartilage rings provide structure. There's full rings up here. And then on the bronchi, half rings down here. And the important part of this is that between each cartilage ring is a membrane right here. You can see these membranes between every single cartilage ring. And here in cross section, the black is a cross section of the cartilage. And you can see this tympaniform membrane between each bit of cartilage, right? Right here. And around this whole structure of the syrinx are muscles. So for most birds in the world, many birds in the world, they have two pairs of muscles, syringeal muscles here. And when a bird breathes in and out, what the syringeal muscles do is they pull the cartilage rings apart and together pulling them tight, relaxing them, pulling them tight, relaxing them. And what happens is you end up with a drum head here, drum head here, drum head here, drum head here. Every single membrane becomes a little miniature drum head. And all of those little drum heads with different levels of tightening and loosening of the membranes create all the complex frequencies that come out as what we hear as a single sound or a single voice. It's just an incredible mechanism. And what makes it more interesting is that there's another group of birds called songbirds. They have six extra pairs of syringeal muscles for even more control of all of these rings. And songbirds also add another piece of cartilage here called the pestilus for even more control. And that's what allows songbirds to have amazing, beautiful songs as, a, as compared to like a heron or a duck going quack. 
you know, that's a non-somber, very simple syrinx. So if you look at all the birds of the world, there's 31 orders of birds, and 30 of those orders are not songbirds. They have a very simple syrinx with two pairs of muscles, and they are born with their songs. So if you take an egg from a bird that's not a songbird and raise it in isolation, guess what that bird says when it grows up? Because it's born with its song, it has a perfect adult song when it grows up, right? Then one order of birds in the world are the songbirds. They have a very complex syrinx and they have to learn their songs. So if you take an egg for one of those and raise it in isolation, guess what it says when it grows up? Nothing. It does not know how to vocalize like an adult. It needs to learn the songs. And if you take your field guide, just a standard field guide, and look at this right here. This is when you look at a field guide from the beginning of the book to the end is evolutionary advancement. So the first birds in the book are the most basic birds. The last birds are the most advanced birds. And if you go through a field guide, halfway through the book, the flycatchers is what divides 30 orders of the birds versus one order of birds. And flycatchers are right here, exactly halfway, which means that so for you, let's see, this is the first half of the book, we'll say for you, first half of the book is 30 orders of birds. And as they evolved, at one point, they, they developed advanced complex songs, and the half of the birds in the world evolved very quickly because of complex song. It shows you how important complex song is to birds. Oh, and here's a really cool point. Who learns songs out of all the groups in the world? There's only five groups of animals that learn songs. Songbirds are one of them. So what are the other four? Well, humans and primates are one. Whales and dolphins are another. Any other guesses? I don't see you, but uh, elephants is one. So big animals. And then a really small animal, shrews. Um, no. Bats, sorry, bats. <laughs> I was thinking too small. Bats learn their songs too. Five groups of animals in the world learn songs. It's a very specialized subset, and songbirds are one of them. One thing that's really cool about songbirds is that a lot of them even have the ability, they have two syrinxes and they duet with themselves. Each syrinx is controlled independently with different nerves, different muscles, two different sets of membranes, creating a complex song. And thrushes are a classic example of birds that have two syrinxes. So I'm going to play a wood thrush song. A very beautiful song, but it's a little fast. So again, we'll try our trick of playing it at half speed. Now listen to this at half speed. This is just mind boggling to me. And what I did with the sonogram here, you can see I drew two brown boxes. I put a box around the contribution that each syrinx is making separately. And, and you'll just hear this first two parts of this. You're going to hear this right here, where two syrinxes are singing separately and independently at the same time, stacked on top of each other. And that's what's making the incredible song. That's incredible. I'll play it again because that's so neat. At half speed. So that's two syrinxes singing at the same time. Okay, so it's classically defined a song is a bird's most musical and elaborate vocalization. Well, call is the simplest vocalizations. We have all been taught that songs are used for courtship. But this is not necessarily true. Surprisingly, scientists have never been able to prove that songs are used to attract females, and they've never even been able to define what a bird's song is. So, for example, some birds use their simplest vocalizations all day long when they're singing for females, and then they use the most complex vocalizations for other things. So there's one species, for instance, all day long, the males are doing their territories and talking to females and at the nest and stuff, they're using their very simple vocalizations. Then at the end of the day, when the sun is going down 
and the females are asleep on the nest with the eggs and the babies. The males all get together, line up on branches shoulder to shoulder and sing their hearts out like a glee club. It has nothing to do with territories or females or anything like that. So what do you do with that? I mean, it's a song, but it's not used for courtship or attracting females or territories or anything. So with 10,000 species of birds in the world, there's so many exceptions to the rule. You just can't define what a song is. And I'm going to use song and call interchangeably. Really, we're talking about bird vocalizations today. So, so imagine that we're all, all out walking together. Okay, we're going on a bird walk. And we're walking along. And a bird, let's go over here. A bird sings up in a tree, right? And so we're all bird watchers. What do we do? The first thing we do, we hear that bird singing in the tree. Up comes our binoculars. We're all looking around. Oh, oh I think I see it. There it is right there. Oh, it's singing right there, right? And that bird hadn't sung, we wouldn't have noticed it. We would have kept walking and, and overlooked it entirely. And that's exactly what predators do when birds sing, which means that every time a bird sings, it is risking its life to say something. So if a bird is going to risk its life to say something, what is it going to say? Well, obviously, the first thing it wants to say is what species it is. Hey, I'm a yellow rumped warbler. Hey, I'm an American robin. Bird wants to announce what kind of bird it is. Also wants to say something about its overall regional location. So say a, um, I don't know what, a Buick's Wren of uh, Las Vegas, if there's Buick's Wrens there, is going to sing a different song than a Buick's Wren of Reno. Um, so in each geographic area, the birds are going to sing different kinds of songs, different dialects. You want to say where you belong. And you want to announce that you're available and ready to breed. Okay, so if you're going to risk your life to say something, are you going to say, hey, hello, ladies, I'm going to be available to breed next week? No, you're not going to do that. You're going to say, hey, I'm ready to breed now, right? So you're going to say something about your reproductive condition. So does distance away matter if you're another male? Well, yeah, it probably does because the distance between males constitutes a threat. So they wanna say something to each other about how far apart they are. But does distance away matter to a female who's listening? Well, no, probably not. Because if a female hears a male, she can choose to move closer or further away. It doesn't matter how close he is. That information is not important to females, but it's important between males. And the amount of song indicates the health of a male because a healthy male, by definition, defends a territory that's rich in food. And the more food there is, the more free time he has to sing. And so it signals the amount of singing you're doing signals how healthy you are because you have the best territory. And if you give birds extra food, those birds will sing more. They will have more babies. They will attract the first females of the season. And the females that mate with those males that sing more, lay more eggs and have greater nesting success. So your, your health is also um, impacts your song because if you have any kind of parasites or disease, it gets imprinted in your song. If you have any kind of developmental stress when you're growing up, that gets imprinted in your song. So all of these things are signaled by the way you're vocalizing your health, your mood. Um, so does it make sense that a male's mood is going to be reflected in his sounds? You know, the female can hear him and say, well, is he timid? Is he cocky? Is he respectful by other males? Is he a take charge kind of guy? They, you know, you could hear that between two males at a, at a party of, of humans. Birds can certainly do that too. And longevity. Well, obviously, older males have more practice songs. They're more elaborate. And then this last point is a really important one. So we're going to talk more about this. But males want to signal that they're part of the neighborhood and that they belong. But in general, with all of these strategies, a singer's goal is to manipulate the behavior of other birds, and their goal is to manipulate his behavior. And so over time, over evolutionary time, this whole system of strategy and counter strategy has led to a communication system that encodes an extraordinary amount of information. And any bird that listens closely will succeed and will survive. And this creates generations of super singers and super listeners. So a bird has lots of different kinds of vocalizations. So for instance, the common chickadee, 
everyone knows chickadees in some way if you have a feeder or something. A chickadee has 14 kinds of vocalizations and song is just one of them. So the way they begin to understand this is to record the different vocalizations, you know, use that software to look at the sonograms and then compare that against the behavior that's happening and begin to understand what these groups of vocalizations are doing. So let's look at three of the most common vocalizations used by chickadees. So we have the common chickadee D call. Perhaps you're familiar with that. There's four components, A, B, C, and D. In this example, we just have A, B, D. Um, chickadees use it around bird feeders. They use it in the winter. They use it when they're mildly alarmed. And they can combine these components in hundreds of variations. For example, the number of D notes, so chick, uh, D, 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 D. The number of D notes says something about the predator that's up there. So if it's one to two notes, it means there's a red-tailed hawk. If it's four notes, it means it's a pygmy owl that they're warning each other about. And each flock of chickadees has its own unique version of this chickadee call. And when a new bird joins the flock, it matches its song to theirs. So here's the chickadee call. And then another vocalization are gargle calls. These are complex sounds used by males during aggressive interactions at close range with each other. Each male takes a few, there's a pool of notes they can use. They take their own individual selection out of this pool and that is their unique vocalization for who they are. Hey, I'm Joe, this is my territory. Well, hey, I'm Steve and this is my territory. That's what they're saying with these calls. And then there's the classic, hey, sweetie, which we would call their song because males give it from exposed perches um, as if they were serenading and stuff. And one, I'm going to play this one, but one thing I want to point out is they also do something really cool called song shifting. So if you're singing all day, you want to change your song so you don't bore your listeners, you don't wear out your vocal cords, you don't wear out your muscles. So within your vocabulary, you shift your song over the course of the day. And even in a very simple example like this, you can hear the song shifting. So this one's going, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. Just a slight shift. Listen for that. Okay, so lots of different kinds of vocalization. Song is just one of them. So if we look at just songs, each male also has versions of his song that he sings and all of these versions together are his repertoire. So for example, toeys. Each toey has three to eight songs that it sings. It sings each song about 30 times, then switches to a new song, sings that about 30 times, switches to a new song, sings that about 30 times. And that's what they do all day long. So let's listen to those. So there's three versions here, each one twice. That's one. There's the second one. There's the third one. So just to practice that, here they are again. And I put the sonogram so we can actually see the shape. And then we can begin to train our ear to actually hear this. So I'm gonna play the same ones again, three versions, each one twice. So these are subtle and they're hard to hear at first. But once you start listening for them, they are happening all the time. But also think about how we go bird watching. So we might be walking along as a, you know, walking along as a group on a bird walk. A bird pops up, it starts singing. We come up with our binoculars. We're like, oh, look, look, look. Oh my God, it's a toey. It's so beautiful. And then we get out our book. We find it in the book. We check it off. And then we keep walking. So if that bird is singing its song 30 times for each version, what are we gonna hear in that amount of time? We're gonna hear that one version. 
But if we sit down and eat lunch, say, and sit for an hour, we're going to start noticing that it's going through its repertoire if we're paying attention. Here's one more example of a common bird, red-winged blackbirds. They're doing the same thing. Each male has about four to eight different versions of its song. Its familiar song is Conqueree, Conqueree. You hear it around marshes. They're singing now, as a matter of fact. Hear it again, two versions, each one twice. See if you can hear this. This is one. And here's two. Those are examples of birds going through their repertoire. Again, singing each one about 30 times, then moving to the next song in its repertoire, going to the next song in its repertoire until it gets to the end of its repertoire, going back to the start and going through them again. And at least you think it's just males that do everything. Females also do a lot of vocalizing too. They can sing in a lot of cases, but they don't need to. Remember, singing reveals your presence and exposes you to predators. So why do that if you don't have to? Let the males do it. In the example of red-winged blackbirds, these beautiful males are sitting up here, singing their hearts out. Their strategy is to attract the harem. They want to get like 30 females in their harem. So he's up there going, he's showing off his beautiful feathers and he's going, hello, ladies, come on over. I got room in my harem, right? And she's sitting here going, hello, come over and help with the nest, you know? And so he's singing his song. He's here in his brown box. Hello, ladies, I'm, and she comes over the top of him with this noisy squall shrieking at him and drowning out his message so that no females can hear it. She's drowning out his message. <laughs> so not all bird calls are unique and variable. So for example, many birds share calls that they all need in common. If there's a hawk hunting nearby, every small bird in the neighborhood needs to know that the hawk is there. And they all use the same alarm calls to share that information. And the reason for this is very simple. If other birds understand your alarm call, you save their lives. And if you understand their call, they save your life. So it's a reciprocity. So let's see. So imagine that uh, imagine that we're all sparrows in the ground, just hopping around, eating seed on the ground, and a hawk flies over. And I look up. Oops, I'll look this way. Look up. And I see the hawk flying over. What do I do? Watch out, everyone. Wham. Guess who gets eaten for revealing their location? I do for sounding the alarm. So there's no reward for me to warn you if I'm going to get eaten. So what all the birds do is they've agreed on a very high 8,000 here, 8,000, 17,000 here, very high, thin note. That's easy to hear, but impossible to locate. It's ventriloquial. And so all the small birds hear that high, thin call, and they all freeze in place. They know there's danger. They don't know where it is, but they just freeze, and they all warn each other. So here's three examples of that. It's going to be high and thin. Not everyone might be able to hear this, but listen for this. Very thin. And I apologize if you didn't hear that, but that's the point is it's, it's very high and very thin. And likewise, this one will be easier to hear. An owl is also a threat to the neighborhood's birds, but what is an owl doing in the daytime? Well, an owl is sleeping, right? And so it's not a threat like a hunting hawk is. So when they find a bird, I mean, when they find it, when birds find an owl, let's say, they all want to do a mobbing call. Hey, everyone, over here, there's an owl right here. They all want to hear it. They all want to locate it very quickly and come over and harass the heck out of that owl. So here's three examples of birds saying, there's an owl. Let's get it. So all alarm calls, but two different groups of alarm calls for different threats. Another way that bird songs vary is uh, dialects. Let's see, what are we doing in time here? Uh, we may go over on time. This is this is such a great topic. I hope you don't mind if it's a little bit longer, uh, but I'll go and then 
Olivia, you can jump in if I'm going too long, but this is so, so cool. I want to keep going. Um, so dialects are really interesting. They start out as subtle differences between different neighborhoods. And then over time, they can lead to the evolution of new species because birds like to hang out with and breed with birds that sound like themselves. And they don't like to breed with ones that sound different. So here's a theoretical model of how that can happen with uh, white crowned sparrows. These birds live in sh uh, brushy, shrubby areas. So here's a whole population of white crowned sparrows that are all singing the same dialect A. Then say, imagine a big fire comes in, burns out a huge area that's uninhabitable. No birds are in there. Over time, the vegetation starts growing back. A few colonizers start moving into this burned area. And if they're successful, they start creating small mini populations of breeding birds. And over time, they're gonna develop their own unique dialect for their little neighborhood. And if they're successful, these little neighborhoods now have different dialects, A1, A2, and A3, and their populations expand outward until they hit the boundaries with the larger population here. And what's fascinating is that these boundaries are very stable and they don't shift over time. Birds don't cross over them. It can be just a few yards apart. Birds on one side won't breed with birds on the other side. And that is what leads to the evolution of lots of songbirds very quickly over evolutionary time. Here's a real world example with marsh wrens. Marsh wrens in North America are really fascinating birds. And if we look at this map during the ice age, their population got divided in half by glaciers coming down out of the north. The red represents their summer breeding range. So you have these big glaciers that came down, cut east coast and west coast populations in half. They evolved different songs. Then the glaciers melted, the populations expanded and they meet again. And that green line goes right through the center of marshes and cuts right through the marsh. Birds on one side of the line sing one song, birds on the other side sing the other song. They never cross that line and never breathe with each other. And basically they're evolved into two separate species. So here's what they sound like, the Western marsh wren versus the Eastern marsh wren. So there's two main reasons why birds might sing. We tend to think of birds singing to attract mates, as if the males were the dominant focus of the entire social hierarchy. But there's a growing body of, audio, uh, growing body of evidence that actually the entire system of birdsong and breeding is controlled by females. It's female choice that drives the evolution of diversity in birds. And if you imagine it from the female's point of view, it makes a lot of sense because she gets to choose who she likes based on songs. The males have no choice but to sing their hearts out and hope for the best, right? So it turns out that males have two different needs, two different sets of pressures if they're defending territory or trying to attract a female. So if you are defending a territory, you're doing it because there's another male right next to you, right? You're one, one bird is saying, hey, I'm Joe, this is my territory. The other one's saying, hey, I'm Steve, this is my territory. They're right at the territorial boundaries with each other. Well, you don't want to be screaming at each other, hey, I'm Joe, I'm Steve, blah, 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 blah. Because guess what? You're revealing your presence for predators and you're going to be sitting ducks. The predators are just going to eat you up. So when males are doing this kind of thing right next to each other, they're really close to each other on a boundary, disputing a boundary. They use substitute sounds as uh, they're substituting for combat. They're also substituting for being loud. They're very quiet sounds. And each male is saying his own voice. Hey, I'm Steve. Hey, I'm Joe. So they can recognize each other. So this is the example of the gargle call. Remember that? The characteristic of these kinds of calls is that they degrade quickly over distance. So if you're close up, you can hear it clearly, but as soon as you start moving a little bit apart, the sound degrades and gets fuzzy and muted. And um, it's only meant to be heard close up. So if you hear a crisp 
version of the song, you know the intruder is close. If you heard degraded version, it's off on its territory. You're not going to pay any attention to it and ignore it. But if you're trying to track the female, this isn't going to work. So imagine there's a female coming from Mexico, going to Canada. She's flying overhead, a thousand yards overhead. And you're down here on the ground. You're looking up. You're like, hi, I'm Joe. Is that going to work? No way. She can't hear you. And she doesn't care if you're Joe. So you need to have a different song that says, Yahoo, hello, ladies. I'm a male yellow rumped warbler. And then she goes, oh, one of my species comes down to the ground to check you out. She doesn't care if you're Joe. She cares that you're a male of her species wherever she's flying on her migration. Totally different. And so the important thing about this is that the information is about, it's a generic information about the species and it's carried for a long distance. We heard this with the chickadee song. And these songs carry a long ways, clear information carrying a long, across a long distance. You can hear these quarter mile away in the forest, maybe. Now, this is where I think it starts getting cool, if it isn't already. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting about these songs is that males recognize the songs of their neighbors. And in fact, they share a lot of the same songs. It is immediately apparent to them when a strange bird shows up in a neighborhood. So in this example, I'm not gonna play the sounds, but with this bird here, Indigo Bunting, here is a territory holder and his song. Here is his next door neighbor and his song. Look at these two songs. Do you think they'd recognize each other? they're almost identical. There's some little differences because one's saying, hey, I'm Steve, and one's saying, hey, I'm Joe, but they know each other's songs, and they basically share the same song. And look what happens when a stranger shows up in a neighborhood. Do you think they're going to recognize that this bird does not belong? This stranger can't even sneak in and pretend like he belongs because he doesn't know their song. It's an immediate, easy way to signal membership in the neighborhood and to notice when a stranger shows up because strangers are threats. And not only do males know each other, but they know where they belong in the neighborhood. So here's an example from a classic study they did with oven birds. They took three males next to each other, one, two, and three. They removed male one and they played his song through a speaker on the boundary with male two. Well, guess what male two does? nothing. I mean, this is male one singing right where he belongs on his side of the boundary. Not a problem. Male two might sing back, but no big deal. Then they played the song of male three through the same speaker in the same location. And what does male two do? He goes bonkers. So does he know male three? Well, yes, of course he knows male three, but male three is in the wrong spot. That requires action. And they, they agree on this boundary, so no action is needed, but they don't agree on this boundary, so you better show up and assert that this is your boundary. There's going to be some confrontation. So they know each other, and they know where they belong in the landscape. This is a diagram from a song sparrow study. And the circles represent not territories, but vocal vocabularies, repertoires. And each male song sparrow has about 10 songs in its repertoire, and each letter represents one of the songs in its repertoire. So bird one has A, N, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine songs in its repertoire. Bird two has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 songs in its repertoire. So what this diagram is showing is the 10 songs on average that each male has in his repertoire and the overlap between neighboring males. So these males next to each other, in this case, one and two have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven songs that they share. And then they have other songs that they don't share. They will never sing these songs that they don't share to each other. So again, these letters represent songs in our repertoire, right? So when they sing to each other, two neighboring males, they have two choices. One is called a tight match. So if bird one sings song B, bird two can sing B back. That is a song type match, a tight match. 
It's really aggressive. They do that a lot early in the season when they're working out their territorial boundaries with each other. Highly aggressive, very confrontational. They need to figure out who's the boss, whose territorial boundary is where, and agree on that. So they do a ton of this type matching, but you can't do that all season long. So for the rest of the season, they switch to repertoire matching and they sing songs that they share here in their shared repertoire. So if bird one sings B, bird two will do F, E, H, J, K, or L, other songs that they share that are a repertoire match that says, hey, I know you, but we don't need to fight because we know each other. But that's different than saying, hey, I'm pissed at you. I'm pissed at you back, which is a tight match and really aggressive. And here's a real world example of this with our favorite marsh wrens again. And wow, this is really cool. These birds are amazing. Marsh wrens have 150 to 200 songs in their repertoire. Just absolutely incredible. What's even more interesting is that all the males in one neighborhood all share the same repertoire and they use that to encode a tremendous amount of information. So they have 150 to 200 songs in a repertoire. Every minute, each male has to make 20 different choices about how to respond to a neighbor's song. And if you look at all of its neighbors, it's about 600 choices per hour per neighbor about what to say in response to each call that the neighbor's doing, and each thing says something different. That's a tremendous amount of information. It's just amazing. So I'm going to play this. This is tight matching. And the put a microphone out in the marsh. One bird is further away from the microphone, so it's quieter. It's going to be harder for you to hear. One bird is right next to the microphone. It's louder. But listen to the first bird going through the sequence and the second bird is responding to every exact song, tight matching it word for word for word through the entire repertoire. They will do this for days endlessly until one quits in exhaustion, then they know who's dominant, right? So I'm gonna play this example. The first half is quiet, so you may have to turn up. The second half is louder so you can turn it down. Totally incredible. They'll do that for hours, it's amazing. So that is really aggressive tight matching, trying to figure out who's gonna give up first, just in each other's faces. Um, so let me go through this slide and then check in with Olivia. So just to summarize this part, um, remember this, each species has its own unique vocalizations saying who it is. Each region has its own dialect. Each neighborhood has songs that males share. And then each male has its own repertoire. And look what's going on here. This is a ton of stacked layers of information that's going on at once. That's a ton of information that birds are saying at every moment, tons of possibilities. It's totally incredible. Um, and I think it's also interesting that, that a lot of these males will share songs with each other um and have a common repertoire so why do birds share songs with each other well it seems that birds share songs with each other for a very simple reason which is that long-term neighbors are preferred to newcomers because newcomers are inherently expansionistic by their nature while old neighbors respect boundaries and there's a boundaries that they've agreed on so if a new bird shows up it doesn't have a territory it needs to kick and push and carve out some space for it, for itself, that's a threat. Whereas the neighbor you've been next to all season isn't a threat. So all of this information is encoded in songs. And if you can listen and hear all of this going on through songs, you can spend more time eating food. You can spend more time taking care of your young. You can spend more time looking for the right female for you. Um, and so it's very efficient 
to share songs with your neighbors, have an entire neighborhood of overlapping songs where the males all understand each other and what's going on, and they can respond quickly to threats that disrupt the system. And this is so important to these birds that they actively teach the babies their songs. They teach them, they tutor the babies and teach them the songs because a newcomer that's a little baby, a, you know, a juvenile bird showing up is not a threat in terms of territory. And that juvenile bird is also is a threat because if they don't recognize its song, it's going to be constantly like a thorn in the side. So it's better to sit down and teach that juvenile that shows up your songs so it fits in and isn't a constant uh, challenge or disruptive influence in the system. I think that is so cool that the older males actively teach the songs to the youngster that shows up. So in this study, we'll go back to the song sparrow study. This will be an example of what's going on here. So in this study, these were four males with established territories. A young male showed up. You know, he's just a newbie, teenager, whatever. Um, not a threat to them. They don't care. This is what that newcomer did. The young bird learned their songs. And the bold-faced letters are the songs that that young male learned. So it's learning songs in the overlap zones. See right here? And there's probably another male here with overlapping. There's another male overlapping here. That young male is learning the overlap songs because those are the ones that show that you belong. And over the course of the first year, the chances of one of these four old timers dying is pretty high. And if one of them dies or goes absent, that young male that's taken time to learn the songs in the overlap zones can signal that it belongs and just step right in and take over one of these territories with no problem at all. It already knows the shared songs. Incredible system here. Olivia, let me check in with you. I got a few more sets of slides, but I can call it if this is long enough. This is a great stopping point, but I can do a little bit more if you want. I think since we just hit eight o'clock, um, what okay. if we do 10 minutes for questions? Yes, let's do that. Uh, let me just do my last the slide chat. then, and, and then we'll go right into the questions. So in summary, um, I want to remind you that birds take a huge chance when they sing. They reveal their presence. They risk their lives. They have something important to say. And we, scientists, and us are just beginning to understand some of the stuff that's going on with their vocalizations and some of the nuances that are going on. Birds seem like they're trying to defend territories or trying to attract um, females. And what I think is fascinating that everything I've talked about here is something that you can hear in your backyard. And we have come a long ways in understanding of bird songs, especially with these sonograms. I wanna remind you, you can get that free software and play with them yourself. But in conclusion, I want to leave you with two really important thoughts. So even though we now have this ability to measure the nuances of bird songs and the frequency and the timing and everything like that, we actually still have almost no idea what the birds actually hear or what matters to them. We can measure all this stuff, but we don't know what matters to them. And the other thing I want to leave you with is that I think it's incredible that out of the 10,000 species of birds in the world, there are only a handful and literally only a handful of birds that we have recorded all the vocalizations of and we know their vo their vocabularies. The vast, vast, vast majority of the birds in the world, we haven't even begun to record all of their songs yet. And I say that because you could go out with a microphone and this free software and start recording birds when you're hiking, going on walks, nature walks in your backyard. And a lot of what you're going to record is going to be new to science. And I think that is incredible. And you can share your recordings with the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology and other people. So I just find this, it's just such a fascinating idea that there's so much still to learn. And I encourage you to pay attention to birds in that way. So let me go ahead and wrap that up and come back to the presentation. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Can you see the chat or would it be easier if I read I can, the I can see it, but you can go ahead and. All right, Margaret had one earlier in the evening that said, what about male mockingbirds that sing during the night? Does the female even care about courtship if she is asleep? Okay, well, that was one of the big parts of the way I left out here at the end. <laughs> it was a whole sequence of mockingbirds. So mockingbirds are these incredible mimics. And in that case, the males have 
200 songs in their vocabularies. And what they're doing that is so amazing, and I don't know if I'll get to your question exactly, but what I think is amazing about them is they are sampling and mixing sounds in their environment. And the older the male gets, the more practiced and large his vocabulary becomes because he's signaling that he's been there so long and has been so good at defending his territory that he's learned all the sounds in his environment, which shows that he's a terrific stud and a great choice for mating with. So what they'll do is, uh, I think this is more answer to Margaret's question, is they sing during the night to attract the female. And then as soon as they attract the female, the song drops off. And then when she's on eggs, it drops off completely. Then they're silent. And then what happens later is that the chicks grow up and leave and the female has to make a decision about nesting again and whether to stay with that male or move to another male. And then the male starts singing again, trying to say, hey, Remember me, mate with me again, mate with me again. If he's successful, she'll stay and mate with him. So I hope that, yes, so she cares. It's, she does isn't listening because she's, um, it, he's not singing when they mate. Once they mate and she's on a nest, he's not doing it anymore. It's to attract the female. And a mockingbird song can be heard by 50 other males within hearing range. So they're really, there's a huge network of mockingbirds talking to each other all night long. And they know when they're made it, I think. So anyway, long answer, because it's a great topic. Thank you. Okay, Kevin asked two questions. The second one's about mockingbirds. So I'm going to do that one first. Is there a purpose or strategy for mockingbirds to copy so many other bird songs? That's exactly what I was just saying, is that they are signaling their membership in that neighborhood. I have been here so long that I can imitate every sound in this neighborhood, every common sound in this neighborhood. It shows that I have like a long-term residency here. And I could only have a long-term residency here if I am a total stud that's able to defend this territory. And I've lived a long life. I have great genes, pick me. And the more song elements that they have in their repertoire and the more connected it is to the place, the more successful they're gonna be. Hope that answers the question. Awesome. Okay, can you talk about the process of how humans discovered what each bird song means? <laughs> that's great. Well, that's a great, great, great question. And um, um, that is, uh, there's a lot, a tremendous, I mean, the poor people that are recording bird songs and trying to study them are just like this insurmountable amount that they have yet to learn. They're just beginning to scratch the surface with a few species that they, someone will pick and intensively study. Um, but I mentioned this earlier is that the way to do it is to record the birds vocalizing. You can analyze it with this software. You can look at the shape of the diagram and then look for distinctions. This song is different than this song because it has this shape and these qualities. And then start matching those up with different behaviors and different contexts. And then just beginning to look for patterns in how those, you know, how the different shapes of different songs, different types of songs, vocalizations match to different behavioral contexts. And then over time, you begin to build a picture of it. So I think that answers the question. Awesome. Okay, we'll do one more. If singing awesome. announces their presence, do birds scope out the area for predators before they launch into song? That's a pretty specific question. <laughs> I don't know. You can ask them. <laughs> um, I don't think so because the message is more important than you know if you if you're going to be a hesitant male and not sing because you're looking around for predators another male next door is going to be singing so imagine there's that female flying over from mexico to canada and you're like hi 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 and your neighbor's saying hi 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 and then the next neighbor's like oh i don't know there could be a hawk up there maybe i should wait a second you know who's going to get the female right so there's no benefit to that you just i mean males think about the colors on males they're these flamboyant like brilliant rainbows of colors they're singing their hearts out they're sitting ducks for predators so they don't have the option of being coy and uh, discreet they got to just put it all on the line breed as much as they can as fast as they can and that's with poor males that's what they have to do whereas the females are kind of brown and drab and they don't have to sing they don't get eaten nearly as much so I think that a bird is a bird. There's no benefit to looking around for predators. You just got to sing. And then if you see a predator, you would stop, but you're not going to be looking first and missing your chance. So 
Is that all the questions? We can't keep going. Oh, well, I guess that's all the questions anyway. That was all of them. I'll <laughs> okay. close out for us. Uh, Olivia, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And uh, again, please, um, if you're interested, follow my newsletter. I'm doing all kinds of articles every week. And uh, I record other presentations and I put them on there for subscribers. There's a whole section of videos if you want to see more videos. But I love sharing this with folks. I look forward to seeing you again next month. I think it's next month. We have another great topic coming up. Two more. Look forward to it. Yep. Thank you, everyone. And just a reminder that Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a membership-based organization. Over 80% of our donations we receive go directly to advocating for wilderness protection, restoring habitat for wildlife, and maintaining hiking trails. We'd love for you to become a member and join us in keeping Nevada wild and beautiful. And like David said, we have another speaker series next month, April 6th. And I dropped the link earlier in the chat, but if any point between now and then you want to RSVP, it's under our Southern Nevada calendar of events page on our website. Um, and next week or next month, Clarice will be back, but it was really fun getting to fill in. Uh, uh, so thank you. thank you, everyone. Great job. Um, with thank that, you. have a good night. Bye.